Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's session of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. This afternoon, we focus on a book by David Johnson Lee entitled The Ends of Modernization, Nicaragua and the United States in the Cold War Era, published by Cornell University Press. Our discussants this afternoon are Cynthia Arnson, a distinguished fellow at the Wilson Center's Latin America program, and Elena Van Omen, lecturer in contemporary history at the University of Leeds. I'm Eric Arneson from the George Washington University. I co-chair the seminar with Christian Osterman of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. The Washington History Seminar is a collaborative and nonpartisan venture of the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program and the American Historical Association. And for over the past decade, the seminar has been meeting weekly, before COVID, in person at the Wilson Center, and since the pandemic, and now I guess the post-pandemic era here in the virtual realm. A few FYIs before we get started. First, today's uh, 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 we invite you to return to the seminar when we meet next week on March 27th to explore a just published book by Alexander Pantsoff entitled Victorious in Defeat, The Life and Times of Chiang Kai-shek, China, 1887-1975. Second, as always, we like to recognize two people whose behind-the-scenes efforts make these seminars possible, Pete Bierstecker of the Wilson Center, Rachel Wheatley of the American Historical Association. And finally, on the logistics front, please note today's session, as always, is being recorded and can soon be found on our institution's respective websites. And when we get to the question and answer section of the webinar, we ask those of you with questions to use the raise hand function or the Q&A function on Zoom, and we'll call on as many folks as we can. With those preliminaries out of the way, let's get the seminar fully underway. Christian Osterman is our moderator this afternoon. Christian, the screen is all yours. Thanks, Eric, and welcome back. Um, it really is a pleasure for me to introduce our speakers um, this afternoon or this evening. I'm coming to you from, from Germany, um, both a, a wonderful author and book and uh, two uh, wonderful scholars as, as commentators who will get our discussion started. Let me introduce our um, first speaker, David Johnson Lee. He teaches uh, U.S. and Latin American history at Temple University, where he also received his Ph.D. in 2015. He's the author of The Ends of Modernization, Nicaragua and the United States in the Cold War, published by Cornell in 2021. The book we'll be talking about this afternoon, as well as uh, of a host of other uh, reviews and articles. Uh, he's won a number of awards, including the Samuel Fleck Bemis Research Award of the Society of Historians of American Foreign Relations. David, congratulations on the book and the Zoom room is all yours. Thanks very much. Um... So uh, thanks, of course, to Wilson Center for having me. Thanks for uh, Cynthia and Alina for the commentary. And thanks, of course, to the audience for tuning in. So I understand I'm supposed to give a quick kind of recap of the, of the main ideas of the book here. I'll take, should take about 15 minutes. Let me share my screen. I've just got a couple of points on the slide here. So basically, I thought I'd begin by talking about the ideas that animated the book and what kind of questions I was answering and trying to answer and going into my research and writing of the book. The big question that led to the book, of course, was trying to understand the ways that development policy is shaped by the ideas and actions of non-US actors. So when I began my work uh, about a decade ago in, in grad school, I, there was a lot of literature on the theory and practice of development as carried out, especially during the Cold War. And much of this literature emphasized the kind of uh, US-centric origins of, of these policies, right? The, the modernization theory coming out of elite institutions and the Cold War anti-communism coming out of Washington, DC. And I wanted to understand how uh, non-US actors, the people on the receiving end of these development policies conceived and reacted to them. And so I began my research by investigating in Nicaragua, how Nicaraguans in particular saw these, these policies em emanating from the North. 
I quickly discovered that, well, in fact, many of these policies themselves had their origins in the global South. For instance, the Alliance for Progress was, although partly a product of these modernization ideas coming out of Washington, was also a product of Latin American ideas, groups like the Economic Commission for Latin America, led by Raul Prebisch, and the um, Caribbean anti-dictatorial movement led by Jose Figueres in Costa Rica. And these ideas were integrated into the earliest versions of the Alliance for Progress. So from the get-go, right, I saw that this is much more of a dialogue than I had originally understood. Then the next question I was led to was, well, how do actors in now in Nicaragua try to use these ideas that are part of US efforts at carrying out the Cold War, how do they try to turn them to their own interests? So sometimes the interests of Nicaraguans are congruent with those of the United States, especially say the anti-communism of the US government and the anti-communism of, of the Somoza regime. But on the other hand, the, I found very quickly that actors in Nicaragua often turn this power coming from the United States to their own interests. And so I try to heavily emphasize throughout the book, uh, the multivalent nature of U.S. empire. That is, Nicaraguans themselves had in quite a, in fact, a quite sophisticated understanding of the complexities of U.S. power and the fact that there are many multiple interests that the U.S. government is trying to carry out in, in, in carrying out these kind of development policies. And often these kind of interests can be at odds with one another and can perhaps be turned to the interests of local actors in this case. And so in order to carry out a study like this, it became necessary to explore the, the local power relations within Nicaragua itself, the way that different actors within this local situation understood not only the relations with each other, but also the global scene. And so this led to a kind of exploration of the way that these power relations in Nicaragua itself change over time in relation to this larger global state of affairs. It's also, of course, in constant transformation. Right. So next, I wanted to study, right, based on this premise, right, how these development policies that the U.S. government is promoting, not just in Nicaragua, but around the world, change over time in reaction to both resistance and cooperation. Right. Nicaraguans were often quite on board with aspects of these development programs, but quite opposed to other aspects of them. And so through this process of conflict and contestation, I found that, well, of course, these development policies themselves change quite drastically at times. And so this set the basic framework of the study, study examining at different moments in time from the 1960s all the way through the 1990s, how these development policies change in reaction to situation on the ground in, in places like Nicaragua. And I found too, of course, that although Nicaragua is one of many places where these policies are being carried out around the world, because of Nicaragua's long shared history with the United States, in fact, there is quite a lot of, of, uh, of contestation and, and uh, interaction with the US government. And, and Nicaragua becomes a very significant place where these policies are carried out and leads, I, I argue, to significant impact on the policies themselves at the national level. So, to understand change over time, it's also necessary, I think, to emphasize continuities and be aware that although, yes, these, these development programs change quite drastically from the era of the Alliance for Progress to the post-Cold War world, in fact, there are, there are also quite a lot of continuities. So um, Amy Ofter, in a recent review of the book in Diplomatic History, argues that right, the first thing that jumps out to readers often is the fact that, well, looking at the 60s and the 90s, to the 1990s, there's, there is quite a lot of continuity. And the biggest continuity, of course, is that at the end of the day, the United States government maintains its overwhelming economic, political, and, and military power and the ability to impose itself on Nicaraguan sovereignty. So this is a, a major continuity, but I argue throughout the book that the ways that this these sovereignties express themselves can vary quite drastically and have very significant different uh, outcomes on the ground in Nicaragua itself based on these changing circumstances. Other, there are other continuities throughout this period. Some, some of the concepts of development also, which will change quite drastically, some of them do maintain continuity through this period as well. The concept of self-help, for instance, this is one that Offner herself has, has studied in her work on Colombia. 
I examine it in Nicaragua, and it's present in the earliest versions of the Alliance for Progress, and actually provides a point of, of a kind of congruity between the interests of the U.S. government and local Nicaraguan actors, many of whom saw self-help as a way of maintaining an image of national autonomy, maintaining an idea of that the ultimate goal of these programs is not to make, say, the Nicaraguan nation into vassals of the United States, but in fact to forge some kind of national autonomy and greater economic prosperity. However, right, because of the continual imposition on, on Nicaraguan sovereignty in the ways that essentially many of the, almost every one of these conflicts is going to ultimately come out in a, a resolve itself in favor of U.S. interests, this concept of self-help changes pretty drastically over time. And so the concept of self-help that gets applied in the 1990s is going to be very different than the one that's applied in the 1960s. And in the 1990s, it's going to essentially involve drastically lowered expectations for what development programs can actually bring about and the kind of autonomy that international develop, can, development can actually promote. So another continuity that I want to emphasize that runs through many of these chapters is the reliance of the U.S. government and these programs of development on a private sector in Nicaragua. And so from the earliest period, I discovered that the turn to the so-called private sector was essentially a, a kind of outgrowth of an attempt to solve problems in the conception of development itself. And so originally, as the Alliance for Progress had been conceived, it was conceived as a government-to-government -government program. That is, the U.S. government supporting the government of Nicaragua, and the government of Nicaragua was then going to use these funds to benefit the people of Nicaragua. However, a big problem that arose immediately was the fact that although the Somoza family is very much in favor of support from the U.S. government, the Somoza family is not the ideal recipient of the largesse of U.S. foreign policy, given the fact that it's a patrimonial dictatorship propped up by a National Guard created by the United States itself. In other words, a, a pretty clearly imperialistic form of government. And so the private sector becomes a useful tool for the U.S. government in trying to resolve this, this tension of this appearance of seeming to support this, these dictatorial forces, but the, the claim, but claiming to be supporting the growth and development of Nicaragua people, Nicaraguan people themselves. And so the private sector becomes a, an important vehicle for managing U.S. interests without necessarily having to directly support the Nicaraguan government. This plays an important role in the 1960s, actually in reconciling the opposition, opposition from especially Nicaragua's conservative elite, reconciling them to the domination by the Somoza regime. It then is going to play another important role in the 1970s as the U.S. government tries to manage a counterinsurgency led by not only, not only the radical left inspired by the Cuban revolution, but also Nicaragua's own conservative parties who become increasingly disillusioned with the United States. And then ultimately, the private sector is going to provide the seeds for the Contra war, the, the opponents of the Sandinista regime that the United States government tries to cultivate to undermine the this leftist government that comes out of the 1979 revolution. Right. So those are important continuities, bearing in mind, however, that right, even these concepts, the private sector changes drastically based on these changing circumstances. Now, the discontinuities, of course, are many as well. And each chapter examines different concepts and, and different uh, ways that the ideology of development, the practices of development are applied in different ways based on these differing circumstances. Right. So although the concepts of development change drastically and are often produced outside of Nicaragua, nonetheless, they have extremely important material consequences within the country itself. And so one of the most uh, eye-opening studies, chapters for me in developing the book was my study of the reconstruction of the city of Managua after the earthquake in 1972. This became a kind of crucible where the U.S. government tried to reconcile some of the contradictions within its own development policy, right? The Nixon administration, on the one hand, was very openly in favor of the domination of the Somoza government. 
However, many people in the United States government itself who were tasked with reconstructing this city after this massively destructive earthquake are not quite so comfortable with directly supporting a dictator. So too, they need the support of the uh, Nicaraguan people themselves. And so they use concepts like decentralization, the idea that, that a planned form of, of urban growth can actually decentralize the city, make it safer from earthquakes, make it more prosperous, and perhaps even undermine the power of the dictator. On the other hand, right, this, this isn't what actually happens, although it does help reconcile some people within Nicaragua, at least temporarily, to the reconstruction efforts by the Somoza regime. Ultimately, the product is what's widely perceived as a as a monstrous city, a city that that is unlivable for for its inhabitants. And this, very importantly, is going to lead to a kind of coalescence of opposition to the Somoza regime, both again from the radical left, but also from the country's own conservative elites who begin to see in the city itself an emblem of the failure, not only of the Somoza regime, but of U.S. efforts at development. And this is going to lead them to support a much more radical revolution than they might otherwise have. So material consequences can continue through the 1970s as uh, the, the counterinsurgency that both the Somoza regime supported by the United States carry out is very much shaped by new development concepts. And these concepts have changed pretty significantly by the 1970s based on the widespread critiques of the failures of early, earlier development policy. So in the 1970s, we get the rise of concepts of human rights and basic human needs. Human rights, on the one hand, condemning the, the corruption and abuses of governments like the Samosas themselves and calling for reduction of aid by the U.S. government to these corrupt dictatorships. Basic human needs programs, on the other hand, also critical of development policies, but critical of them for having failed at actually redistributing wealth and critical of them for essentially leaving the poorest of the poor, as they were called, behind in these development programs. And so, in fact, as I found, this this gets used as a tool of counterinsurgency. Basic human needs policies essentially end up supporting the Somoza regime much in the way that earlier policies in the 1960s had, based on very different uh, justifications and with very different material consequences, but ultimately leading just the same to ongoing support for this dictatorship, which ultimately proves unsustainable and ends with the 1979 revolution. The final discontinuity, of course, is going to be with the Reagan administration itself and the Contra war that breaks out in the aftermath of this revolution. The Reagan administration, of course, very famously opposed to its predecessor's efforts at development, critical very much of the human rights efforts on the part of the Carter administration, critical of the uh, of the premises of the Alliance for Progress itself, but the Contra War actually drew on many of the structures that had been created by these development policies themselves. The, the private sector that's been cultivated since the 1960s becomes the repository for the Reagan administration's efforts to undermine the revolution from within. Added to this, the Reagan administration also tries to exploit uh, tensions within the revolution itself and tensions within this international community that came together in the late 1970s to support the revolution and uses many of the same ideas that had been used to criticize the Somoza administration to essentially try to tar the, the Sandinistas as yet another dic dictatorial movement. And this, although ultimately unsuccessful in removing some of the most vocal supporters of the of the the Sandinista revolution, nonetheless, divides many of many of their supporters, socialist uh, fellow travelers in, in Europe and Latin America, and contributes to the uh, lessening of support for the for the Nicaraguan government, and actually an increase in dependence on the Eastern Bloc and the Soviet Union. So that's the uh, main idea. How am I on time? I'm not timing myself. I think um, you know, yeah, maybe a couple more minutes. But if you want to bring it to to a close, so we yeah, can, that's, you know, have time for debate. Absolutely. So, so basically, this this sort of question of continuity and discontinuity covers 
early period of the book. So each chapter goes through these different uh, development concepts at their particular historical moment, showing how the contradictions within them lead to political conflict and lead to um, significant transformation in the historical situation itself. So I basically discussed already the chapters one through four. Chapter five deals with the revolutionary period itself, talks about how the indigenous rights movement also grows out, both of, well, it grows out on the one hand of the efforts on the part of indigenous people themselves to organize and, and resist imposition of uh, central government programs all over the Americas, but also it's made possible by changes in development ideology itself and the growing de-emphasis of central state power and a much greater emphasis, like with these basic human needs and human rights programs, much greater emphasis on uh, local autonomy. This will, of course, end up being used as a way by the Reagan administration to undermine the government in Nicaragua itself. And then the final chapter, chapter six, deals with the post-Cold War moment, the way that after the end of the, the Cold War, Nicaragua becomes essentially, yet again, a laboratory for these international development ideals, seen as a kind of blueprint for a neoliberal republic, but against the, the kind of expectations and wishes of those in Washington, essentially, right, Nicaraguan elites had their own ideas about how to manage these new systems that are being put in place at the international level. And so the new government that comes into power, the election of Violeta Tomorrow, is not nearly as willing to bow to the wishes of Washington as they might have expected. And so this leads yet again to a kind of crisis of power and ultimately to a much, much more explicit imposition of the idea that ultimately the United States is the ultimate arbiter of outcomes, outcomes in Nicaragua and uh, essentially, the democratic process has been for naught. And then the uh, epilogue tries to bring things up to the present. Of course, Daniel Ortega returns to power in 2007 through a democratic election and once again tries to manage the economic instability in Nicaragua by turning to a new set of alliances, uh, China on the one hand, the massive canal building program and the pink tide governments led by Chavez's Venezuela on the other. This manages to reconcile con these conflicts for a period of time, but of course in 2018, the inability to uh, provide the ultimate promises of, of development and the Ortega government's increasing imposition of authoritarianism leads once again to a kind of political explosion. And that's basically where we're still at today. Thank you. Thanks, sure. David, for a yeah. uh, good, good overview. Um, it's now my great pleasure to welcome Cynthia J. Arnson uh, to the Washington History Seminar. Uh, Cindy, uh, as, as I call her as a former colleague, is a distinguished fellow and former director of the Wilson Center's Latin America program. She's really one of this country's foremost experts on the Spanish-speaking countries of the Western Hemisphere. During more than 20 years at Wilson, she has testified before the House and Senate and has produced scores of publications on Colombia, Central America, Argentina, Venezuela, security and organized crime, energy, human rights, and US policy in Latin America. A former foreign policy aide in Congress, Dr. Arnson has also had positions at Human Rights Watch and in academia. Her list of publications really too long to mention here. Uh, she's really one of the leading lights in this country on the uh, on the region, and it's uh, uh, so great to be able to welcome her. I think for the first time to the Washington History Seminar, Cindy, uh, the floor is yours. Or the Zoom room is yours. Great, thanks so much, Christian, for that very generous um, introduction, and uh, thanks, David, also for walking us through um, the book. I have to say that I really really loved it. I have been steeped in Nicaraguan politics um, as a congressional aide in 1977, the first year of the Carter administration, a veteran of the effort to cut off $2.1 million in military aid to the Somoza dictatorship, and then back on the Hill um, in the 80s during the, the years of the Contra War. Um, so 
I um, I was very much going through familiar terrain, but I learned so much. I think this is a book of deep scholarship, of um, deep knowledge of Nicaraguan history and uh, Nicaraguan intellectual currents and the range of sources. I mean, I think it's really, um, it is quite impressive. Um, for many decades, and I think what this book offers is that for many decades, the history of the U.S. encounter with Nicaragua has been put exactly as we are discussing in the context of this seminar in, in terms of Cold War history, um, particularly focused on uh, this insurgent Sandinista guerrilla movement, how the Carter administration tried to grapple with it, um, and then how the Reagan administration tried to undermine it. And I think that the bulk of writings by US scholars focus on that dimension. And what you really have contributed um, is, uh, is, is just to place those debates during the Cold War within um, this context, context of the shifting development paradigms that governed U.S. foreign assistance. And of course, Nicaragua was an important um, recipient. You also lay out the intellectual and cultural traditions in Nicaragua, the leading thinkers, the way that cultural um, renovation before the, Sandin before the Sandinista revolution and also long before by its major critics um, helped um, have what you have called this dialogue um, with U.S. policymakers, and and the outcome is very much um, a product of that interplay. Um, I think you provide really a devastating critique of modernization theory, and the chapter that discusses the reconstruction of of Managua following the 1972 earthquake um, is is just uh, incredibly illuminating. Um, it is uh, as you have have just laid out. Um, it it shows how modernization theory was used by Somoza not only to line his own pocket, um, but to separate you know, the city between rich and poor to create these marginal communities on the outskirts of Managua that had no access to services and thereby um, not just the corruption of Somoza, but the disaffection of these people that had been displaced from the center of Managua, um, um, that that contains the seeds of, of protest and uh and and rebellion and you mentioned the um uh the there's a name that you that you give to these shanty towns essentially um and i recall visiting them when they had the um the, the name open which was the uh operacion permanente de emergencia nacional they were not even um given a name they just had a number there was open 1 open 2 open 3 open 4 those were the places where the water wars took place um in the 1970s and and a great deal of uh, activism and um uh and and uh, a, a sort of a cradle of, of urban um, uh, militants. Um, I'm not sure, to be honest, that your critique of the Alliance for Progress goes far enough. Um, I think that uh, you do mention, for example, that USAID includes a police training component for the National Guard. But the way I, I sort of interpret the period of, of the alliance is that you had on the one hand the development goals, but on the other hand, the security goals rooted in anti-communism, which led to all of these police and military training programs. And they were in a sense, two sides of the same coin. But as we've seen over and over again in Latin America, when security issues um, become predominant, you know, the uh, a communist takeover of a friendly uh, regime, um, the security issues always trump. And so I think that, you know, I probably would have gone farther um, in the in the critique of the alliance. Um, in the Q&A uh, uh, section, I'd like to get into some of the basic human needs and the way that the human rights debate transformed um, 
the discussion about Nicaragua, because again, I, I when I was on the Hill, I was working with one of the principal architects of that of that legislation and that approach. And and I think that there's a different that that there's a difference between the way the legislation was intended and the way it was implemented by the Nix administration. I think that's an important point. Um, and then my. Um, my final, the final area which I hope we can get into in the question and answer period has to do with the ability or the, the uh, what I think is perhaps an inflated sense of the United States ability to remain as an arbiter of Central American politics and of Nicaraguan politics. If anything, I think what's going on in Nicaragua today and throughout the Central American region um, demonstrates the limits of US power, not its defining um, uh, aspects. Uh, and in, in the case of Nicaragua, you know, there are cutoffs of economic aid, threats of cutting off trade and, and uh, Nicaragua's status within the, the Central American Free Trade Agreement, economic sanctions, individual sanctions, and still Daniel Ortega is has consolidated an authoritarian dictatorship. So I hope in the Q&A we can get into, um, you know, what's next for Nicaragua's future. And then finally, you mentioned the role of China, the role of European and Latin American social democratic and Christian democratic movements. But I think increasingly hostile powers to the United States, Russia, to a much lesser extent, Iran, are now um, playing important, um, not necessarily decisive, but certainly important roles in helping Daniel Ortega reinforce, you know, his repressive apparatus. Anyway, I think it's a terrific book. I learned a ton. Thank you for writing it. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Thank you. Cindy, go ahead and ask your questions, uh, uh, by all means. If you'd like. Well, I, I why don't we turn? I, and I'm not sure I'm going to pronounce her name. Is it Elena? Elena. 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 Okay, we, we, Elena. We can, we, let's Elena go, and then we'll then we'll have Adam. Okay. Wanna, sounds yeah, sounds sounds yeah. sounds good. All right. Well, then, um, actually, before I I, I um, turn introduce um, Elena, let me remind our viewers that you also can participate in this discussion. Preferably, we'd love for you to chime in directly by uh, you're pressing the uh, raise hand function in the Zoom functionality, and uh, um, uh, we'll be queued and I'll call on you. Um, alternatively, you can post your question in the Q&A function of Zoom, and then I'll put it to our speakers. Um, but we'll preference those who'd like to ask a question directly um, to the panel. With that, let me introduce our third speaker, uh, Elena van Ammen. Uh, she is a lecturer in contemporary history at the University of Leeds. Um, came there after uh, during her MA and PhD, I think, um, at the LSE, where uh, I also got to know her part as a uh, editor of uh, the journal Cold War History. Her specialties include the Cold War in Central America, transnational activism, and revolutionary diplomacy. Elena's forthcoming monograph with the University of California Press deals with the international and transnational history of the Nicaraguan revolution, focusing specifically on revolutionary Nicaragua's relations with Western European countries and peoples. It draws on archives and oral history interviews in Nicaragua, Cuba, the United States, the Netherlands, Germany, and the United Kingdom. She previously taught at Utrecht University and obtained her PhD, as mentioned, in international history at the LSE in 2020. Alina, it's wonderful to have you with us. Zoom room is all yours. Fire away. Thank you uh, for that introduction. And thank you um, so much for uh, yeah, inviting me to talk about this, this book, um, which I really, really loved. And it's really nice to take the time and read a book from cover to cover, which I don't think um, I do enough. Um, so yeah, I wanted to start out with just, yeah, giving my compliments uh, to you, David, because, um, yeah, it's really uh, excellent. So I thought I'd start by just saying some of the things I really liked about the books and then moving on to some of the questions or things we would like, I would like to talk about more, um, which are ironically linked to the things I also like about the book, um, 
So that only shows that it's not, it shouldn't be seen as, as criticism, but more as things I would like to know more about, hear your views, and also perhaps future directions uh, for scholarship. Um, so one of the really the strengths about the book is obviously, I think, the way it brings in Nicaraguan voices uh, and acts, actors. And as you mentioned in the introduction, like it really shows convincingly how these ideas originating in the global south and specifically Nicaragua really shape um, thinking in the global north. Um, and yeah, that's, um, I think, really well done. And I think that's linked to another thing that I really appreciate it, and that is how you bring in um, culture um, and you use these kind of these novels and poems, um, which not only makes for really enjoyable reading, but also I think you show convincingly how this is linked to Nicaraguan nationalism and how it's linked to um, the role it really played, the role culture played and the role these intellectuals played in shaping Nicaraguan history, but also in shaping um, US foreign policy. And um, I think one of the, the stronger parts as well is the really the long-term perspective the books take. Um, the books take is taking on um the revolution uh, and the post-revolutionary period. And I think in that way it made it made me think about Claudia Rueda's uh, recent book, Students of Revolution, which also adopts this really long-term perspective, but ends with the triumph of the revolution per se. But I think you also really show how the revolution the origins of the revolution have a much longer history than I think um, the current historiography um, seems to suggest. Um, so that was a thing I really appreciated. Um, another thing I really liked is that um, obviously the book has is about U.S. Nicaraguan relations, but there's also a range of different actors. So it's really is in a way very much an international history and you use so many different uh, sources from um, Europe and um, as well. So obviously that's something um, I really appreciated. Um, and I think that that's also brings me to some a, a thing I would like to yeah hear your views about because it made me kind of question this this bilateral uh, lens that you adopt because obviously this is a book about U.S. power uh, and U.S. Nicaraguan relations and I I can see how it is very useful um, as a way to understand um, the way the U.S. implements its foreign policy but as someone who is primarily I guess interested in in the Nicaraguan revolution I also wondered, particularly in the later chapters, um, how useful this bilateral lens actually is, because I think as the book progresses, the history of Nicaragua becomes more and more internationalized and less and less about US-Nicaraguan relations. And I think that might be also why the first two chapters have a particularly strong argument showing how, for instance, the Alliance for Progress is so much linked to the consolidation of Samosa's power, how the reconstruction of Managua is very much about um, U.S. involvement and how it backfires. But then in the later chapters, you see how it becomes a much more complex story. So I would like to kind of hear how, yeah, how you grappled with that and how you can think, how you think we can perhaps write this more international history of the Nicaraguan Revolution without it becoming just a cacophony of different voices and actors, because that's obviously an, a risk that is there if you want to incorporate everyone. Um, so your views on kind of how, why you made certain decisions about which, who to incorporate and which is which actors. Um, and because I think I was also thinking about modernization and obviously you look at the US, but then what about, for instance, Cuban views of modernization? I've, um, why did you kind of, they don't seem to feature as much, but I, I can imagine they had a big influence on the way the, the Nicaraguans, uh, the Sandinistas especially, um, built their government. Um, so yeah, I would like to hear a bit more about. Um, and linked to that point, I was also thinking about U US power. Um because I think it, there seems to be an agreement that U.S. was a powerful and important actor in Nicaragua, obviously. But then one thing that actually struck me as I as I was reading the book is they always fail; like they never achieve their objective. So they try and implement the Enlightenment progress, and then what happens? The Nicaraguans go with it, and Somoza becomes more powerful, which is the opposite of what they wanted. They want to prevent a revolution. The revolution happens. They want to overthrow the Sandinistas through military force. That doesn't happen. So 
when we talk about power and the role of the United States, how how do you kind of see and understand power there? Because it seems to be quite an, an unsuccessful empire there. Um, so is that is Nicaragua unique in that sense, or is it just uh, just me um, kind of wanting to hear more about kind of the nature of empire here? Um, and then I guess the final point for now is, and that's a question that kind of haunts the book a bit uh, for me, is that it's on the origins of the Nicaraguan revolution. So I think all of the chapters are in a way linked to that, the er early chapters at least. So in the first one, the one about uh, the earthquake, it's obviously very clear that you make the point that it's not the earthquake itself that causes the revolution. It's the way Ni Managua is constructed after that. But then the other chapters seem to suggest that it's more about the role of the campesino, about lands, about this kind of cultural nationalism that is being created. And then the, the chapter after that is more, it seems to suggest that it's more about the Sandinistas and their revolutionary diplomacy. So, um, yeah, would you, um, I would like to hear your views on that, like what actually is here driving the Nicaraguan revolution or is it, does this all come together? And that brings me actually to the final point. Um, and you mentioned that in your talk, and I think it is very uh, striking in the book. And that is obviously the theme about the theme about change and continuity. Um, you talked about changes in U.S. foreign policy and ideas about development, but it's also these um, Nicaraguan elites that stay the same throughout much of the period, um, despite that, on the other hand, there seems to be these moments of radical change, such as the earthquakes, such as, such as the revolution, such as the, the election of 1990. Um, so your thoughts on kind of, yeah, are there moments of radical change or do you think this is ultimately a story about continuity and um, resistance and collaboration with US uh, empire and the global uh, arena here? Um, so those are just some of the thoughts I had, but congratulations uh, on a brilliant book, which I really loved uh, reading. Thank you, Elena. Thank, thank, thank you, Elena, and thank you, Cindy, for wonderful, thoughtful comments. David, you want to respond? And then why don't, you know, I'll just give uh, Cindy and Elena the, the floor to kind of re respond in turn or engage you some more on some of the, the questions that... Uh, and issues that Cindy and Alina put put on the on the table. Over to you, sure. David. How about, how about I'll start with the the questions from Alina since they're fresh in my mind, and then we can go back to Cynthia and she can uh, give me her questions there. So I I appreciate Alina's observations and many of her concerns are exactly the same sort of concerns I have coming out of this and right the the, the problem that. No book can do everything. I wish I wish I could do <laughs> could study every aspect of, say, the the global situation. And uh, to be honest, when I began the the book project, some people looked at what I was doing and said, "You're probably not going to be able to do that. This is too ambitious. You're not going to be able to cover this massive period. This is you're you're never going to find sources." And right, certainly. It, sources get much, much harder to come by the later you get, right? By the 1980s and 1990s, you have to begin being very creative about sources. And I appreciate Alina's appreciation of the, the role of culture here, right? So part of the joy of, of writing a book like this was to deeply engage with all of the the, the culture that Nicaraguans themselves are producing, but also it became a kind of necessity, right, to to try and think through in the absence of other sources, what, what, what can we do to get at, say, the perceptions on the part of local people of this international situation? And so it's both, both kind of a joy and a necessity in that sense. Um, so the issue of the questioning the bilateral lens, I, I think that that's a very a very important one, and in a way, it's it's a very very deeply related to the pro the problem of continuity and change, right? So at times it does look like Nicaragua is breaking free of the United States and actually building its autonomous development. But essentially, as I argue in the in the book, right, these these moments of seeming autonomy are exactly the moments when US foreign policy kicks into gear. And although you're right that in terms of bringing about specific outcomes, say, the of 
right? Um, creating a kind of happy democratic utopia, which I don't know that anyone ever actually believed was, was gonna happen, right? Those, those don't actually achieve themselves. But when it does come to a crucial moment, like in the eighties, when Nicaragua does seem to be actually bringing together this international alliance of social Democrats and social Christians uh, that can actually threaten U.S. hegemony in the hemisphere, the U.S. government is actually very effectively, I argue, able to drive a stake in the heart of that alliance, right? The, the Contra War itself, I think, serves this very important political purpose. They don't, they don't achieve their goal of overthrowing, or their stated goal of overthrowing the Nicaraguan government. And even people in the U.S. government complained that, well, actually, the Contras don't seem like they really care about overthrowing the government. They're more interested in selling cocaine and, and getting rich. But right, the, the the funding of the Contra War and the politics of the Contra War was very effective in in drawing a wedge in this international alliance, which the Reagan administration saw as a a, a, a danger, not just in terms of promoting governments like Nicaragua, but also in creating legitimation for uh, socialist ideals in the hemisphere, right? So the chapter on pluralism is about how there is a moment of opening as these various international forces are coalescing and say, oh, like Mexico and France, for instance, trying to get international recognition for the Cuban government and get the United States to break the blockade. But the US government uses the Contra War as a way of driving these forces apart. And so it does achieve that goal, which arguably for its own purposes is more important than say, achieving specific outcomes in Nicaragua itself. So that in the end is, is, is how, and that gets to how I would define the power of empire here. The power, part of the power of empire is not having to care about, care that much about specific outcomes in Nicaragua itself. This is, this is the argument of uh, Greg Granin in Empire's Workshop, that part of the reason there is so much intervention in Latin America is because in terms of actual security interests, it doesn't actually matter that much for U.S. global interests, but it matters very much as a kind of place where the power of empire is demonstrated. And I think the, that the ultimate ability for the U.S. government to short-circuit attempts at building alternative alliances, building alternative systems of development, the, this, this is the ultimate outcome that is achieved and successfully so by the Reagan administration, but even, even in the post-Cold War world, right? The efforts to use American foreign aid, American access to other funding, right? Not only the threat of cutting off American foreign aid, but the threat of getting international donors to stop their aid to Nicaragua. This could essentially short, short circuit any political outcome and devastate the, the country. And so part of the power of the US government is through sometimes not exercising that. So in the, the final chapter in the Cold War, I call this the nuclear option where the the U.S. government creates a bill that essentially would allow it to remove all funding from Nicaragua. It doesn't have to use that, right? Rather, this is the ultimate weapon because Nicaraguans themselves know that should this be used, it would be totally devastating to Nicaragua's economy. So I would argue that there is quite, quite a bit more success in promoting its interests and policies than, than meets the eye at first glance. Um, and maybe, well, maybe we could come back to the, the question of what's really driving the Nicaraguan revolution. So, again, in, in terms of why this focus on bilateral relations, and I, I totally understand that, that treating, the, treating the relationship with the United States as the sole determining factor or the end all and be all of, of this relationship is to do a disservice to Nicaraguans themselves. But right, given the overwhelming power, and also given the fact that well, Nicaraguans are very cognizant of the power of the United States in this situation. And so even when they are challenging the power of, of the US government, cha challenging US hegemony in the hemisphere, they're doing so very self-consciously, knowing that right, they're poking the bear and that right, the United States is going to respond and they're going to have to shape those policies, knowing that 
the United States is going to, at the end of the day, be the most important arbiter, even still to this day, right? Despite recent efforts on the part of, or well, efforts in the 1980s to turn to European donors that end up not playing out, or the turn to the Eastern Bloc that fails not only because of the collapse of the Soviet Union, but also for internal reasons, but more recently efforts at alternative alliances, building the, the canal, for instance, what turned out to be a chimera, the um, Alba turned out to be right, dependent on uh, temporary spikes in oil prices and, and uh, commodity prices. So right, ultimately, at the end of the day, the Ortega regime also understands that it's, it's most important bi bilateral relationship remains with the United States, whether or not it wants that to be the case. Um, thank, thank you. you. Cindy, you want to chime in? Sure. Uh, two very disparate comments and then a question. Um, one has to go with this uh, idea that you're looking at the bilateral U.S.-Nicaraguan relationship and not enough at the other actors and, and their role um, or, or the position of Nicaragua within that international context. And I, I think perhaps the best demonstration of that is the role of, of the former president of Costa Rica, Oscar Arias, in actually setting the stage for the end of the Contra War. It wasn't just that James Baker and others, you know, decided, uh, you know, the election happened, we're, we're out of this. I mean, there was an actual um, um, opening for non U.S. actors to play a significant role because of the fracturing of the consensus over, not even consensus, but the majorities in favor of Contra aid that the Iran-Contra scandal represented. So you had, you know, as opposed to what took place around 1983 when uh, Contadora formed on this island off the coast of Panama between um, Venezuela and uh, Mexico and Colombia and Panama as trying to provide an alternative to keep the Reagan administration from doing something totally crazy and invading El Salvador or whatever. Um, it, you know, it never really gelled because there was too much coherence within the U.S. body politic and too much agreement over the ends, if not the means, of U.S. policy in Central America, um, principally in that time to, you know, defeat the, the FMLN in El Salvador. Um, so RDS comes about in 87, after the Iran-Contra scandal has broken and is able to kind of put together a peace plan that not only deals with the international security issues that the U.S. Has carried, is concerned about, but also the internal democracy issues that, that he and other Latin American leaders, you know, have been pushing for. So that's, that's just uh, one kind of uh, footnote, I guess, uh, to this to this discussion. As you say, you can't put everything in this book, but you know, because we're talking about the extent to which the U.S. Nicaragua helps you understand the the whole. Uh, I thought that was relevant. The other thing, which was very much a text and a book that that I read as an undergrad and a graduate student, you know, um, uh, Samuel Huntington's work, you know, Political Order and Changing Societies. I mean, it was just this seminal book, which I think un helps you understand the longstanding support uh, for Somoza. I mean, his thesis was, you know, modernization didn't lead to sort of um, you know, development and greater equity and the creation of a middle class, which would be this bastion of liberal democratic values, but rather that it was destabilizing. And because it was so destabilizing and um, set in motion all of these different um, social dynamics that you couldn't necessarily control, what you needed was the armed forces to maintain order because they were a, an institution that was far more developed than others. So anyhow, it kind of, that argument hovers in the background of the critique of the Alliance, but, you know, in a second edition, maybe you can make that, you know, a little bit more explicit. So my question to go back to this discussion um, does have to do with the U.S. ability to um, certainly shape, but really define um, what takes place on the ground 
in Nicaragua and in Central America. And I started out in my comments by saying that I think that, you know, uh, if anything, these last few years show the limits of U.S. influence. And so I guess I would question, just ask you, you know, your your la the last sentence of the book, you know, talks about, you know, at the end of the day, the U.S. is still out there. Um, you know, how you would grapple with that in light of what has taken place in Nicaragua since 2021. I mean, you talk about the 2018 protests and the repression, but, you know, you have um, the the jailing of all of the of the critics, including um, uh, Comandante Dos, who was, you know, one of the people uh, not named in your book, but, you know, referred to or, you know, hinted at in the 1974 takeover at the ambassador's house um, that freed, among other people, you know, Daniel Ortega from jail. Um, uh, you know, given that and now the exile and the utter closing of civic space and um, the criminalization of protest and the increased role of paramilitary sort of shock troops, um, not just the, the Nicaraguan, you know, civilian police. Um, where's the, where's the, uh, the evidence, I guess, of, of the U.S. ability to really be the final arbiter of Nicaraguan politics? Yeah, I mean, that's, oh, um, sorry, Christian. No, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Um, so, I mean, that's that, that's a really great question, and I, I, I'll, I'll be honest, I, I don't think that, that, right, despite the efforts on the part of the Nicaraguan, op, Nicaraguan opposition, I don't think they've been able, uh, despite the fact that they would like to be able to, they have not been able to galvanize the same interest in what's going on in Central America or in Latin America in general as they had been in an earlier era. So I think the the changed global context is is very important, right? So there were there were stirrings of greater interest in what was going on in Nicaragua when there was a fear that, say, Chinese interests were were uh becoming uh more dangerous in the region, or Cindy also mentioned uh Iran and Russia, which have have sort of toyed with funding funding groups like like the FSLN and, and ALBA. And right, that has at least at, at, at various moments kind of piqued the interest in Washington and created a, a similar situation of this kind of international call for intervention of sorts. However, right, given the, the last couple of, of decades that in the post-Cold War world, essentially the US government, I think, has largely washed its hands of specific political outcomes in, in Latin America, with the exception of confrontations with Venezuela and the occasional saber rattling towards, towards Cuba or something, right? By and large, this is right, a, a different era. And I would argue that one of the main differences in that era is due to changing conceptions of development. And so the, the good and the bad of this era of the Cold War was that many people in the United States believed that things going on on the ground in Nicaragua were deeply important for the United States, not just in terms of national security, but in terms of hemispheric development and building this kind of vision of, of prosperity through mutual alliance, right? That with the, with the destruction of those ideals has I think we've, we've lost both the good and the bad right the, the the good being the idea that there is there is an inherent shared interest in development across the hemisphere and so one of the tragedies for me of this of this book is that right this right these these events did drive a stake through many of these hopes of of mutual interest, mutual cooperation, and mutual development. And they did so partly because, right, essentially U.S. security interests, going back to earlier comment that Cindy made, U.S. security interests are often used as really the only ultimate arbiter of why we should care, right? There, there are these brief moments in which, right, people in the United States do begin to feel that, oh, yeah, there, there, there is some shared interest here, moments of humanitarian disaster, for instance, or moments of great kind of political upheaval. But by and large, right, uh, it's it's very difficult to convince 
American politicians that American interests are really at stake unless there's some larger global phenomenon that has to be dealt with. So for the time being, I I just don't think that uh, Nicaragua is is on the radar of policymakers in those sense in that sense. And right, this is deeply upsetting to the Nicaraguan opposition, for instance, who see this as a as a failure and a betrayal. And right, I outline in the book the ways that they've often returned to the United States for for this kind of attention, but the the ways that this attention can often, well, backfire as well. So it's not not a foregone conclusion that it will be beneficial to their ultimate interests, to say the least. Thank you. Why don't we see if we're bringing in a couple of other people. Eric, I think you have a question for the panelists, and then I'd like to call on Richard uh, Millet um, as well. Uh, Eric? Thank you. This is a fascinating discussion. And I want to invite you to talk a bit more about your chapter about uh, Nicaragua's indigenous people, uh, the Mosquito Indians, um, and the Sandinistas' misreading um, of political dynamics and the, hard, the ham-handed policies uh, that they implemented that so alienated um, that population. So you go into this in the book, but I'm wondering now if you could just talk a little bit about this for those who are listening. And as follow-up to that, you have in this chapter a fascinating figure, um, a professor of geography at Berkeley uh, named Bernard uh, Nietzscheman, um, who is not just a scholar of geography, but becomes an active participant uh, in advocating armed resistance. Um, and this is not something that most scholars tend to do. Um, but if you could also just amplify his role in this particular moment and in this particular context. Yeah, thank you. So, um, so the, well, I mean, the the question of of armed resistance is an important one, and so certainly, right, the st studies of the solidarity movement, for instance, uh, this is a, an important issue for academics all over the world who who look to Nicaragua and look to these kinds of third world re revolutions as possibilities for genuine socialist transformation. Nietzsche is right, part of part of the fascination for him as a figure is the, the way that he he runs against the grain. On the one hand, he he is taking up this kind of anti-government social social justice cause, but doing so in congruence with the interests of the Reagan administration. At one point, even arguing that that the Reagan administration needed to completely change its attitude towards the Contra, supporting this this remnant of Samosa's Guardia Nacional was a losing proposition. Instead, it needed to create an indigenous alliance for, for Central America. And right, it's, it's radical in its potential, but right, in, in practice, he ended up being almost more strident and more vocal in, in terms of promoting armed resistance than many of the Mosquito themselves, right? The Mosquito themselves understood that, well, that the this international attention was all well and good, but at the end of the day, they were going to have to find some way to coexist with the government in Nicaragua. And it, this kind of utopian program was unlikely to serve their long-term interests. And so they essentially called for negotiations with with the, the Sandinistas, whereas Nietzscheman wanted to radicalize things and and try to almost carry the carry the revolution beyond Nicaragua itself. And so this is a, a case of, as as I discuss in, in other chapters, right, it, and related also to Cynthia's earlier question about international interest in these in these problems, right? Sometimes, right, this is necessary and, and beneficial to these groups seeking these kinds of international alliances, but the, this, this is also very dangerous. These alliances, right, when they're serving their own interests, aren't necessarily completely congruent with the interests of the people on the ground. So Mosquitoes actually, I think, understood that, that, right, yes, it's well and good getting this publicity from an international attention from these indigenous rights activists, from these environmental activists, but, right, our foremost interest is survival and, and helping our communities thrive. And they didn't necessarily see themselves as this uh, 
indigenous warrior elite that, that Nietzscheman wanted to promote their image as. So this, I think that's a great illustration of both the, the promise and perils of these kinds of international solidarity, that sometimes it can push things in, in dangerous directions that don't, don't necessarily serve the interests of those that people are claiming to have solidarity with. Christian and, and Eric, if yep. I if I could just jump in and add a word here, I think that the, chapter, that the chapter on the the Atlantic coast and the Mosquito Indians and the rebellion and it's you know the way it's uh, um, you know overlaps with the Contra War but is different from is one of the most illuminating and original chapters you know of the book. I don't recall seeing anything in the English language that is as detailed and as balanced you know, as uh, as what you lay out. So I, I think that, um, you know, you use the focus on the mosquitoes as a way of showing how indigenous rights became a part of the focus um, of development uh, thinkers. Um, but quite apart from that, um, the role of the Atlantic Coast, the Mosquito Indians, the leadership here in, in, uh, uh, in the, based in Washington, as, as well as in Nicaragua, I, I think was, was really brilliant. I thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, that will be appreciated by David. Let's go to Richard Millet. Richard Millet. And if uh, we invite all of you to join us, uh, use the raise hand function and we'll call on you. Mr. Merlot. Unmute. There we are. Thank you. Yep. Well, having been writing and studying Nicaragua since the 1960s, I guess I have a, a longer perspective than most people do on this. Um, I got one, one quick thing for you, Cindy. Uh, looking at all the Somoza plans for the quote non reconstruction of Managua, the open one, open two, what they did was they gave monopoly bus routes to retired Guardia officers to bring people in from these new settlements to where the industrial, such as it was, part where the jobs were. Um, because for them, they saw bluntly more of a threat to their rule, at least until late in the game, from discontented Guardia officers than they did from the Sandinistas. It was one of the strangest things I ever encountered. But uh, you could name the Guardia. You had to retire them quickly so the next generation could move up. Um, and you could see where each officer was given that monopoly bus route. So the only way to get to a job was to ride it on a retired Guardia bus. Um, that, 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 in some ways, is very typical of the way the Somozas handled whatever could be called modernization in Nicaragua. And it wasn't as unsuccessful as some might think. Nicaragua's income increased pretty rapidly uh, during the uh, 60s and 70s. It was doing better than much to the rest of Central America. Um, but the corruption was so deep, and then the earthquake simply put a peak on the corruption. What you saw with the earthquake was a real break between much of the conservative elites, the business elites, whose own children were now joining the Sandinistas uh, because the corruption had gotten so overwhelming. You know, what I said for years, and you can tell how old I am, um, was that the uh, Samoza stole the cream off the milk and now they were stealing all the milk itself. Um, so that changed them and changed them radically. Um, Your question, sir. Do you have Do you have a question or? Well, I was going to say I wanted to add one other thing on, on this uh, rather importantly. Um, okay. Well, David, you want to respond to that or Cindy? Uh, Sydney, do you have a comment? 
My, mine just really, really quick. Um, Dick, I'm delighted to hear you, you know, join this program. Um, I recall, you know, when uh, those of us in our 20s and whatever started learning about Nicaragua, there was one book about Nicaragua, the definitive book by Dick, by Richard Millet, Guardians of the Dynasty. So, you know, you really uh, set the stage for so many of us in terms of learning about what was going on in the country. So thank you. Yeah, David. so yeah, I, 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 the groundbreaking book, hugely influential on on my own work. Um, yeah, the, his comments about the the Guardia Nacional are, are interesting because, well, one thing that kind of surprised me in my work, right, the, the Guardia, it was both this repressive apparatus, but also it played an essential role, and this relates to Cindy's comment about Huntington and military development, played an essential role in this development imaginary that the Samosas are then using to turn to their own kind of patrimonial power. But I found actually it several times quite surprising the ways that the Nicaraguan opposition, while understanding that the Samosas power depended on the Guardia Nacional, also tried to negotiate with the Guardia as if it might become a kind of independent political force of, of its own. So in the 1960s, for instance, right before the massacre in Managua in 1967, there's actually hope by the Nicaraguan opposition that they might convince the Guardia Nacional to overthrow the uh, the Samosas themselves and and put in place an actual democratic election. Turns out this was probably a rumor started by the Samosas to to kind of urge them into rising in rebellion so that they could then be crushed. But nonetheless, right, there was there was still this hope among this kind of nationalist elite in Nicaragua that the Guardia, as sons of the soil, so to speak, might be turned to the interest of the nation itself. So didn't work out, of course, but it was constant uh, hope throughout. Thank you. I want to turn to John Martin next, but first let me perhaps ask you, David, to talk just a little bit about your sources. This is a history seminar, and I think it's important in this day and age uh, to emphasize that we're not just making this stuff up, but it's based on hard archival research. If you could talk a little bit about um, kind of the path-breaking research you've done and what you didn't have access to. Yeah, so um, as, as I think I mentioned earlier, right? So certainly there, there's a kind of declining availability of what especially diplomatic historians think of as the gold standard, that is the, the government documents, the smoking guns of who's doing what, exactly how they're justifying it and what exactly is being done. Certainly, and again, right when I began this project, people were kind of skeptical that I would even be able to get substantive information about, say, U.S. policies in the 1970s, and and it it was actually kind of a kind of a chore because right a, a lot of State Department information still hasn't been been declassified that far back. But in fact, right, one of the benefits of studying development was that. Agents, agencies like USAID actually did have greater availability. A larger amount of information had been declassified. So, for instance, I was able to look much more deeply into the circumstances of the earthquake reconstruction because these were AID documents and not State Department documents. And unfortunately, right, the right. Um, trying to recreate that feat. So when I when I found that information, this was like striking gold. I knew I had a, a good project to work with, but then trying to recreate that feat, especially for say the revolutionary period or afterwards becomes more and more difficult because there, there's less material that's been declassified. But I would say that right, the, in, in terms of potential for future research, I think there is lots of, based just on the, the incidental research I did Finding information, of course, on other countries. There's there's tons more information to uncover about the the uses to which this money was being put all over Latin America from the 1960s and afterwards. And as this declass declassification process continues, I think we'll get lots and lots more uh, interesting studies of this. Um, and the second part of the question was about what well, what I didn't find. Uh, well, so I mean, one of the, the the things that would would be ideal, of course, in a study that tries to take seriously the the 
Nicaraguan perspectives, right? There, you would hope there would be a lot, lots of government documents on this, but of course, right, while well, the Nicaraguan government archives were actually destroyed in the earthquake and fires following 1972, and there has not been a massive uh, preservation of government documents afterwards and not been massive declassification. On the other hand, Nicaragua does have a wonderful historical institute at the University of Central America that is really groundbreaking in collecting not only these, these kinds of historical documents, but cultural documents and doing wonderful work on promoting the study of the history of Nicaragua, would not have been able to do any of my work without the work that Nicaraguan scholars have done. And so that is immensely valuable, having those kinds of connections, being able to have conversations about these issues with Nicaraguan scholars played a really important role in making this possible. Can, can I ask something uh, about sources? Sure. Because I think what in one of the things I really appreciated as well in the chapter on the earthquake in Managua is the section where this talk about where you really show how um the effects of these these policies and these big ideas on on the ground so you have these images of these these residents like uh protesting the lack of water and stuff and i wondered and i guess i wondered have you kind of found or think about other sources uh, in the other chapters as well that really show the impact of these policies more at on at the grassroots level because i think that could really enrich texts like this as well, like really not just looking at government plans and ideas, but really showing how it played out on the ground, how it was experienced by the people that it was meant to transform, by the people whose lives it was supposed to um, prevent, uh, to improve. Um, and I, like this is obviously a, b a big challenge, but in that chapter, I think you, you do quite an, an excellent job of it. Which, and it makes the story come alive a lot more as well. So for instance on but i was missing that perhaps a bit on the, the the indigenous coasts have you i'm and i know like going to do research now is obviously very difficult but have you looked into that um and thought about that yeah well so uh, the another i mean the archives are as as we all know created by people for a certain interest, right? So government archives are interested in governing. And so that's a very good way to get at the, the lives of ordinary Nicaraguans, for instance. In the case of the, the earthquake, the reason we have those stories is actually because of the, the actors that I'm describing in the story, who both the, the publishers of La Prensa, the conservative newspaper, and their, their own kind of radical staff who were interested in collecting these stories about the experiences of the earthquake victims. And so I was able to take advantage of that because the people in La Prensa went and did that work. Unfortunately, right, th that political moment was fairly unique, right? There are other other moments in which, say, La Prensa or other, other presses try to get at the experiences of, of Nicaraguans, but they are sparser than than you would like. And so in terms of the the issue with the, the East Coast, right, the, although the Nicaraguan opposition was totally on board with anyone who was trying to undermine the Sandinista government, I think their own sort of cultural prejudice, prejudices often kept them from more directly engaging with issues on the East Coast. And so that's one of the reasons I don't think we have those kinds of sources that, right, there, there weren't people with that kind of interest. And we do have people like Nietzscheman, who I was talking about earlier, who is trying to kind of collect the the say experiences of human rights abuses, but he's doing so from his very particular, uh, in the name of his very particular political project, right? So those sources too have to be taken at far from at face value. And so, yeah, the absolutely invaluable resource, but also, right, unfortunately, right, the resources that are created are often created for these kinds of uh, political moments in which, in which they're born. Thank you. Um, John, you're next, John Martin. Uh, thank you, Christian. Uh, David, it sounds like a wonderful book. I've just bought it. I'm really looking forward to reading it. And this is a footnote kind of question, but I covered the uh, the Iran-Contra war. I, I covered the, the, uh, the fighting and, and the trial and so forth. 
And I've always wondered if what you think at the end of the day, the Carter administration deserves as a rating for what it, how it handled things. Is it a black eye or is it something more positive? That is that is a very good question. So um, what I, I I try to show that the, the Carter administration is being pulled in multiple directions, right? So uh, I think the there there again is even even multiplicity within the administration itself, right? On the one hand, there are people who are calling for cutting aid to Samosa because of these manifest human rights abuses. There are others, right? Even people in the, the Sometimes the very same people who are for the, the Christopher Committee, for instance, which has to go through and decide which things to cut, actually uses these development premises, uses the premises that the, the basic needs of the poorest of the poor need to be served. And essentially, they continue to prop up the Samosa government and provide aid, which allows it to maintain its alliances with local people. And so I think, I mean, it, going to, to uh, Monday morning quarterback it, I don't know that in the situation any of us would come up with better solutions, but certainly uh, a, a greater willingness to negotiate more directly with these uh, insurgent forces and to take the interest of those insurgent forces more seriously could have potentially brought about a possibly different, different settlement. So in the actual negotiations, there was a very significant emphasis on negotiating with the the Nicaraguan private sector. And there was a hope that these kind of so-called responsible elements could negotiate a managed transition and one that Washington could live with. And so well, these private sector elements were themselves pretty deeply out of touch with the actual interests and problems of the Nicaraguans themselves who are rising up against the government. And so this kind of emphasis on uh, negotiating specifically with this, this elite whose job was pretty explicitly seen as sidelining the radical efforts of the the FSLN and their allies, I think this ultimately ended up being counterproductive, right? It, it, because right, the FSLN at the end of the day knew that they had the ultimate power. And I think the Carter administration, had they been more uh, forthright about recognizing that fact, could have perhaps save some time <laughs> at the very least and, and save some lives. So I that my my impression is that the Carter administration tried to work often at cross purposes with itself. And so I also try to explore some of the contradictions within uh, Carter's human rights policy and the policy of non-intervention as well. Ultimately, I don't think served the interests of either the United States or Nicaraguans, because I think ultimately this the the idea that the United States is not directly intervening in Nicaraguan political affairs is just an illusion that no one actually believes, right? And so this, this often leads to a use of covert operations and behind the scenes actions instead of openly negotiating and being being forthright about what the what the aims are. So that's just my David, thank if you. I, if I could just add sure. to that, sure. um, you know, uh I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of the different currents within the administration. We think of them as, you know, as a unitary actor. It wasn't at all. And for me, one of the low points was in June of 1979, just weeks before the Sandinistas, you know, marched into Managua, you know, triumphant in July of 79, you had Cyrus Vance calling for an inter-American peace force to intervene in Nicaragua, basically to keep the Sandinista guerrillas from taking power through force of arms. And it was roundly rejected, you know, at, at the uh, Organization of American States by, you know, by Latin American Caribbean governments. And it was to me like the quintessential demonstration of this battle within the administration to move beyond the Cold War at a time when they were very much steeped in it. <laughs> Thank you, Cindy. Um, we'll go to Glenn Cavendish. Glenn, please unmute yourself. 
I'm, I'm not used to this computer. That's why what is happening. I good. would like to, to, can you hear me? Yes. Fine. Yep. I would like to thank uh, the center and Mr. Lee, of course, for this uh, brilliant and indeed very balanced presentation. When I was, I'm a Belgian liberal from uh, Ostend, and in my in the late 1970s and early 1980s, I had two religion teachers who were very engaged in the basic movement. And they taught me a lot about El Salvador and also, of course, about Nicaragua and uh, Mr. Samosa and uh, the Sandinistas. So thank you. It all came very lively back again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there are several questions in the Q&A, um, uh, David, that ask about the current, um, your, your thoughts on, on Nicaragua today. Um, um, uh, given the political situation, the FSLN and control of all the four branches of government, expulsion and stripping of citizenship of political prisoners, uh, de facto exile of hundreds more leading position figures, economic uh, weakness, significant immigration. What do you think is next for Nicaragua? Uh, what for Nicaragua US relations? And uh, I'm happy to extend that to, to Cindy and Elena as well. David. Yeah, I would, I would like to hear what they think as well. I mean, I, I certainly have no crystal ball, and the the significant step recently, of course, was the release of these these political prisoners, which I think was a kind of interesting indication of perhaps a, a willingness to, uh, to negotiate with its own internal opposition and perhaps a willingness to cooperate with other outside governments on the part of the Nicaraguan government. On the other hand, these um, political prisoners when they were freed or stripped of their citizenship and essentially denationalized, which I think was a deliberate choice on the part of, of Ortega to try and strip them of their national identity, which of course, as I try to outline in the book, is for especially the conservative opposition, the worst thing that could possibly happen to them given their, their kind of deeply nationalistic premises. So I think Ortega still demonstrates a, a willingness both to antagonize his opposition and to, to continue trying to antagonize the international community. On the other hand, I, I don't think that, uh, I don't think the or Ortega government is, is necessarily interested in maintaining authoritarianism in the style of, of the Samosas long-term, or at least I certainly hope not, but, remains an open question for the future, whether after the passing of Ortega, there will be a kind of passing of the of the mantle to a family member or a hand-picked associate. Only time will tell. Thank you. Anyone else like to chime in on this final question? We're just about out of time, so this will probably be final mm -hmm. words. Oh. Helena? Yeah, go I ahead. don't know if I want to take responsibility of final words. I just, yeah, like David, I don't, I can't really predict the future. I guess from the perspective of a historian, I, I do think it's interesting to see how current events in Nicaragua or since 2018, how they are shaping the way we, we study Nicaraguan history and the revolution and how it makes us think about perhaps if this was all, if the revolution was always inevitably going to end up in another authoritarian government or not, how there is a lot more interest now and a lot more legitimacy in a way to study the, the Contra war from different perspectives. So in that sense, um, it is um, yeah, really shaping, I think, the way we look at Nicaraguan history. Um, but it's also going to have a lot of negative impacts because I don't think anyone is currently doing archival or oral history research in Nicaragua at the moment. So... Yeah, it's going to, from that perspective of a historian, it's going to have a, a lot of, of impacts for the foreseeable future. Thank you. Cindy, final words? Sure. And in terms of that, the questioning that Elena was just, um, you know, referring to, Daniel Rotega was a member of the Tercerista faction of the Sandinistas, the one that was the most pluralist, the most... Um, uh, prone to look for alliances, you know, with the private sector, with other, you know, anti-Samosa elites. And so for him to be in this position now, I mean, I think does 
cause us to ask some of those more basic questions. Was the Reagan administration right that these people were just, you know, authoritarians, uh, you know, um, keeping around these useful fools um, to uh, as window dressing? Um, in terms of the future, um, I it's hard to feel optimistic. I think there's a, a strong sense that Ortega will uh, try to pass the mantle on to one of his sons, that that's who's being groomed. What that will do to the Sandinista bloc, both in the military, in the police, which I think are really the 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 you know the bulwark of the regime right now. What another non-revolutionary you know original generation figure will mean. Um, for the future of Nicaragua, I think is going to be very important. But because you always, as as you point out so well in your book, had this interplay between international forces and Nicaraguan elites, all of those elites have been silenced. Um, they've been exiled, stripped of their citizenship, stripped of their property. Uh, the church is completely uh, dismantled. Bishop Alvarez is one of the few people that, I mean, the one person who refused to, to be liberated with uh, the other 220 political prisoners. I mean, there is no way that one can envision um, uh, kind of a domestic resistance from coming from society, coming from civil society or opposition uh, political forces, you know, to to pose a challenge. Uh, so really, I think the you know the future will depend on what happens within the Sandinista movement. Um, should Rosario Murillo take over? Should one of the sons take over? You know, how does that shake things up? So I I find it hard to be very optimistic about the near future, certainly. Thank you. There are lots more questions in the Q&A, and we'll try to capture some of those for you, David. But uh, we could have clearly gone on for much longer, but this has been a really terrific, very enriching discussion. Thank you, David. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, Lena. And of course, Eric, um, for a really wonderful afternoon. Eric, final words to you. My thanks as well to our panelists and to all of you in the audience uh, with questions or uh, just uh, watching. Please join us next week on Monday, March 27th at 4 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time for a discussion of Alexander Pensoff's new book, Victorious in Defeat, The Life and Times of Shanghai Shek. Till then, stay safe, good night, and thanks. <laughs>